Welcome back to my channel. If you are visiting this channel for the first time, you are also highly welcome. In this lecture, we'll be looking at the extraocular muscles. The extraocular muscles are muscles that connect the eyeball to the surrounding bones that form the bony orbit. These muscles are primarily involved in the movement of the eyeball. So ride on with me as I unfold the anatomy of the extraocular muscles, the movement of the eyeballs that they exhibit and also their innovations. The extraocular muscles are also referred to as the extrinsic ocular muscles. They are extrinsic because they are located outside the eyeball. Remember, we also have the intraocular muscles that are located within the eyeballs. And the ciliary muscle is a very good example of the intraocular muscle. But for the extraocular muscles, of course, are located within the orbit because they are seen to connect the eyeballs with the structural component of the bony orbits. This is one of the extraocular muscles. This is the superior oblique muscle. This is the superior rectus muscle. These muscles, as you see, the way they run, they are seen to be inserted on the eyeball. And of course, you see them originating from the bones that are said to form the structural component of the bony orbit. As we go through with this lecture, we would see it is not all the extraocular muscles that are involved in the movement of the eyeball but one of which is involved in the elevation of the eyelid. So let's go to the functions of the extraocular muscle. This extraocular muscle, as we described in our previous slide, we said they are seen to connect the eyeball with the bones that form the structural component of the bony orbit. So in this regard, they are seen to be creating a structural support for the eyeball as they are seen to hold the eyeball in place. Also, they are involved in the movement of the eyeball. We know that the eyeball exhibits a number of movements, which includes the elevation of the eyeball. We have the depression of the eyeball. We have the adduction of the eyeball. We have the abduction of the eyeball. We also have the internal rotation and external rotation of the eyeball. All these movements are controlled by the extraocular muscle. We also have the elevation of the upper eyelid. We know that the elevation of the upper eyelid is controlled by the levator papillary superioris muscle. This is the only extraocular muscle as we highlighted before that is not involved in the movement of the eyeball. What it is primarily designed for is the elevation of the upper eyelid. And as we go through with this lecture, we will see how these muscles are able to control these actions in terms of the eyeball movement and also the elevation of the upper eyelid. And this can be justified based basically on their point of insertion. You see that the levator papillary superioris muscle is not inserted on the eyeball. It is inserted on structures outside the eyeball. And that is why it does not control the movement of the eyeball. For the other extraocular muscle that are involved in the movement of the eyeball, you see that as we go through with this lecture, their insertion point is on the eyeball. And that is why they are able to control the action in terms of movement of the eyeball. So in totality, we have seven extraocular muscles. So out of these seven extraocular muscles, we have four recti muscles, we have two oblique muscles, and we have one levator papillary superioris muscle, which is also referred to as LPS. So you can see in totality, when you try to sum up all these muscles, we are going to be having seven extraocular muscles. Out of all these muscles, it is just the recti and the oblique muscle that are involved in the movement of the eyeball, while the levator papillary superioris muscle is primarily involved in the elevation of the upper eyelid. So you can see how the this is presented. We have seven extraocular muscles, but not all are involved in the movement of the eyeballs because of their point of insertion. At the end of this lecture, we'll be able to see that the recti muscle and also the oblique muscles are inserted on the wall of the eyeball, and that is why they are able to control the movement of the eyeball. So let's try and take each of these group of muscles, one after the other, to see where they originate from and also where they are inserted upon. So talking about the recti muscle, the recti muscles, we say that they are four in number. So we have the superior rectus, and this is the superior rectus muscle. Just as the name implies, we see it is located above. Then we have the inferior rectus. This is the inferior rectus muscle here, arrowed in red. Just as also the name implies, it is located inferiorly. Then we have the medial rectus muscle. This is the medial rectus muscle here 
arrow here in green, you can see it is located on the medial side of the orbit. Then we have the lateral rectus. This is the lateral rectus here that is arrowed in yellow that is located on the lateral side. The lateral rectus is cut off at this region so as to expose the medial rectus muscle. And this is what is projected in this image. So we have four recti muscles. We have the superior, we have the inferior, we have the medial, and we also have the lateral rectus muscle. So let's see where they originate from and also where they are inserted upon. The recti muscle have a central point of origination. And where they originate from is a common fibrous ring that is also referred to as the annulus of zinc. So let's say this is the general configuration of the bony orbit. I've done a lecture on the bony orbit. Please kindly go and check that lecture up to keep yourself aligned with this lecture. So let's say this is the configuration of the bony orbit. And we say the bony orbit is conical in shape, which means that it has an apex and also a base. The apex of the bony orbit is directed posterior medially, while the base of the bony orbit is directed to the anterior side. This is where we have the apex that is directed posterior medially. Around the apex, we have the optic foramen. The optic foramen is the opening point of the optic canal. So we have deep to the optic foramen, we have the optic canal. So this is where we have the optic foramen, of course, located at the apex of the orbit. So around the optic foramen, we have a common fibrous ring that is referred to annulus of zinc. And this structure is where we have the origin of the recti muscle. So we have the superior rectus, you know, emerging from this annulus of zinc superiorly. We have the inferior rectus also emerging from this annulus of zinc inferiorly. Then on the medial side, we have the medial rectus muscle that also originates from this central ring medially. Then we have the lateral rectus here highlighted in white that also originates from this central point laterally. So we have all the recti muscle emerging from a single central point. So they have a common point of origin and this is the annulus of zinc. And this annulus of zinc is a common fibrous ring that is seen around the optic foramen. We already stated that the optic foramen is seen at the apex of the orbit. And the apex, of course, is directed posterior medially. And this is where we have the emergence of this recti muscle at the central origination point. Looking at this image down here, this is where we have the central origination point of the recti muscle. This is where they originate from at the apex of the orbit, which of course is directed posterior medially. And it is specifically seen at a point where we have a common fibrous ring that is seen around the optic foramen. And of course, as these muscles emerge from this central point, they widen out. And as they widen out, they are driven forward. So you see that they also run a particular form from where they originate posteriorly to where they will be inserting on anteriorly. And if you look at this image down here, this is where we have the superior rectus here, harrowed in blue. We have the inferior rectus here, arrowed in green. We have the medial rectus here, arrowed in red. Then finally, we have the lateral rectus muscle that is arrowed in yellow. These muscles, you can see that has the emerge from the central fibrous ring. Around the region where we have the optic foramen, you see that they span anteriorly, but they are not just seen to run anteriorly. They tend to widen out from the point where they originate from. So at this point, you see them, they are directed forward and are finally inserted on the anterior half of the highball. So if you try to divide the highball into two anterior posteriorly, this is the anterior half, this is the posterior half. So you can see that these muscles are finally going to be inserted on the anterior half of the highball. So this is the superior rectus here inserting on the anterior half. You have the lateral rectus here also inserting on the anterior half. Then we have the inferior rectus here inserting also at the anterior half, while the medial rectus is at the medial side. So the point of insertion is not seen in this image. And at the point where they insert, it's just behind the point where we have the limbus. It's a junction between the cornea and also the sclera. If you go to the configuration of the high, we know that in the anterior part of this region is where we have the transparent membrane that is referred to as the cornea and this terminate or end at this point before we now have the continuation of the sclera. The cornea and the sclera 
at the most outer layer of the heart. At the front, at this portion, we have the cornea. And of course, this cornea continues laterally as the sclera. So at this point that is harrowed here in dotted black, we have the junction where the cornea at the front here meets with the sclera. And this is called the corneosclera junction. And this is where we have the limbus. So behind this limbus is where we have the insertion of the recti muscles. And these muscles are inserted on the anterior half of the high bone. So if you look at the pattern by which these muscles run, we already stated before that when they originate from their base posteriorly, they run forward and they tend to widen out. So as they widen out, they present a cone-like arrangement. So you see that they run a cone-like pattern of movement. So it's good for us to also be able to establish this. You can see that this muscle will be able to control the action of the eyeball because they are inserted on the eyeball. So going further on the recti muscle, there is a pattern by which they run, even though they emerge posteriorly from a common tendinous ring around the optic foramen. They run forward and be inserted on the anterior half of the eyeball they have a specific pattern by which they run. So for the superior, the inferior, and the lateral recti muscles, this muscle, although they run forward, but they are directed laterally. The medial rectus seem to have a direct path from the point of origination. And the different parts of movement of the recti muscle, which include the superior, the inferior, the medial, and the lateral recti muscles, is as a result of the direction of the apex of the orbit. This is where we have the apex of the orbit here, arrowed in yellow. We know that the apex of the orbit is directed posteriorly and also medially. Because it is directed posteriorly, medially, the part of movement of the medial rectus, because it is on the medial side, is more direct. But unlike the superior, the inferior, and also the lateral rectus, that will be positioned at the superior part, at the lateral part, and also the inferior part, we need to run laterally before they have been positioned in their specific regions. The medial rectus muscle, the only recti muscle that will be seen to have a direct path because it's already in alignment with the medial wall of the orbit because the apex where they all originate from is directed posterior medially. So if you look at this image up here, this is how we have the configuration of the orbit. This is the base of the orbit in the anterior side, and this is the apex of the orbit directed posterior. So if you look at how they emerge, so this is where we have the optic foramen and around it, we have a common tendinous ring. This is where we have the emergence or the origin of the recti muscles. So where they emerge from, as they emerge for the superior rectus, it emerges and you see it running forward, but it is not a direct path. It needs to be directed laterally before it assume the position at the upper part on the anterior half of the high ball. So that is the pattern by which the superior rectus muscle run. It is not a direct path. It is seen to first run laterally before it is then turned and being inserted on the upper part of the anterior half of the high ball. Then for the inferior rectus that is highlighted here in green, you also see that this muscle after its emergence from the common tendinous ring or fibrous ring, you see it being directed laterally. So from this lateral part is where it is being directed on the inferior part, where it then inserts on the inferior part of the anterior half of the high ball. You can see that these muscles are directed laterally before they finally go and be inserted on their specific point. Then for the lateral rectus too, that is highlighted here in white, as it emerges from the common fibrous ring, it is also directed laterally before it is finally being inserted on the lateral side of the anterior half of the high ball. Only for the medial rectus muscle. This medial rectus muscle is the only muscle out of the recti muscle that has a direct path. And why? This is because the apex of the orbit, where the emergence of the recti muscle is from, is directed posterior medially. So it is already aligning with the part of the medial rectus. So the medial rectus is not seen to run a lateral course before assuming the medial region of the anterior half of the high bone. That is the reason behind that part of movement of the recti muscles. Then the next group of muscles is the oblique muscle. The oblique muscles, we say they are two in number. Remember, the recti muscles are four in number. We have the superior, we have the inferior, we have the medial, and we have the lateral recti muscles. For the oblique muscle, we have just two. We have the superior oblique muscle, then we have the inferior oblique muscle. These two muscles 
are seen to have different points of origin. So they do not originate from the same point as seen in the rectal muscle. Remember the rectal muscle have a central point of origination, which is this common fibrous ring that is located around the optic foramen. But for the oblique muscle, they are seen to originate from different regions while they are inserted on the posterior half of the eyeball. If you also go back to the rectal muscle, you see that their insertion point is on the anterior half of the eyeball. So if you try to divide the eyeball into two, you see that we have the anterior half and the posterior half. So the anterior half is what creates insertion point for the rectal muscle, while the posterior half is what creates insertion point for the oblique muscle. You can see that they are already taking their place on the high ball. So let's take each of the oblique muscles one after the other to see where they specifically originate from. So let's look at the origin of the superior oblique muscle. The superior oblique muscle originates from the body of the sphenoid. This body of the sphenoid at a point that is located superior medial to the annulus of zinc. Remember the common fibrous or tendinous ring where the rectal muscle originates from. If you go to the medial side, at the upper part of the medial side of this ring is where we have the origin of the superior oblique muscle. And this is what is arrowed here in blue. So this superior oblique muscle is seen to originate at the medial side of the annulus of Zim, just at the point where we have the emergence of the rectal muscle. So this is where it originates from. So as it emerges, you see it running forward, still along the medial side of the roof of the orbit, because it emerges at the superior part, although medial to where we have the common tendinous ring, which is the annulus of Zim. So it emerges and it runs along that course, still within the roof of the orbit, but on the medial side. So you see it's running through on the medial side. This is still the superior oblique here. As it goes further, you see that at a point, it is inserted onto the trochlea. The superior oblique muscle has a very dramatic part of movement from its emergence point down to where it is inserted upon. When it gets to this specific region here, this is where we have the trochlea. If you look at this region, we have an indentation that is created on the orbital part of the frontal bone. And this is referred to as a trochlear fovea. This fovea is like a pit or a depression within which we have the trochlea. The trochlea itself is a fibrocartilaginous pulling structure. So within the trochlear fovea, we have the trochlea. And you see the superior oblique muscle running through this trochlea. After exiting it, it runs laterally, and this is the harrow showing its lateral course. And during the process of turning laterally, you see it's parting below the superior rectus muscle. This is where we have the superior rectus here. So you see the superior oblique parting below or deep to the superior rectus muscle before it is then directed posteriorly. And this is also the arrow here that is highlighted here in black where it is directed posteriorly. It's directed posteriorly so as to gain the point of insertion at the posterior half of the eyeball. Remember we said that the oblique muscles are inserted on the posterior half of the eyeball which is in contrast with the rectal muscles which are inserted on the anterior half of the eyeball. So it runs from the trochlea laterally and also posteriorly, so as to be able to assume this position. And this is where it is finally inserted upon. So if you try to divide the eyeball into two anterior posteriorly, we have the anterior half at the front, which creates insertion point for the rectal muscle. Then we have the posterior half behind, which of course creates insertion point for the oblique muscle. So if you look at the superior oblique, after running this dramatic course, entering into the trochlea, it decides to run laterally and also posteriorly. And finally, you see it being inserted on the posterior outer half of the high ball. This is the outer part of the posterior half. The inner part of the posterior half is deep, is on the other side. So this is where it is inserted upon, of course, on the sclera. We know that the sclera is the most outer layer or outer covering of the high ball. While on the anterior part here, we have the cornea. So it is inserted on the sclera, but specifically on the outer posterior half of the high ball. So this is where we have the final insertion point of the superior oblique muscle.
Then the second oblique muscle is the inferior oblique. And the inferior oblique, where it originates from, is on the medial side of the floor of the orbit. This is where we have the floor of the orbit. The, the floor of the orbit is mainly formed by the orbital part of the maxilla. And of course, contribution from the zygomatic and the smallest contribution from the palatine behind. So on the medial side, we have the orbital part of the maxilla. And this is where we have the origin of the inferior oblique muscle. This is what is harrowed here in purple. So it's seen to run across the floor of the orbit. It's being directed posterior laterally. It is also directed laterally and also posteriorly because it's going to be assuming the posterior half position where it's going to be inserted upon. Remember in our previous slide, we stated that the oblique muscles are inserted on the posterior half of the high bone. So it is directed laterally and also posteriorly. And of course, at this point, you see it running posteriorly and also laterally. And this is where it is finally inserted on the outer posterior half of the high bone. So if you try to divide the high ball into two, the anterior half, you have the posterior half. At the outer posterior half here, where you can see on the outer part, is where you have the insertion point of the inferior oblique muscle. So we have the lateral rectus here. So on the part of the lateral rectus, you know, trying to move from where it's originated from around the common fibrous ring here, being directed forward and inserted on the anterior half of the high ball. This is how it runs. You now see it overlapping the inferior oblique. So you see the inferior oblique being inserted deep to where we have the lateral rectus muscle. It's also good for us to be able to highlight the relationship at the region of insertion of the inferior oblique with the lateral rectus muscle. So talking about the movement of the high ball in relation to the extraocular muscles, we have a number of movements that are exhibited by the high ball. We have the elevation movement, which involve the upward drive of the high ball. Then we have the depression movement, which involve a downward drive of the... Then we have adduction. Adduction is drawing the eyeball towards the median plane. Then we have abduction, which is taking the eyeball away from the median plane. Then we have internal rotation, medial type of rotation. So when you rotate the eye towards the median plane, and this is also referred to as intorsion, and this, of course, you direct the high ball towards the nose. Then we also have external rotation. External rotation is an outward rotation of the high. And this is also referred to as extortion. So these are the basic movements that the high balls exhibit. And of course, we'll be looking at the different muscles that are involved in this movement. So let's first look at the actions of the recti muscles. We know we have four recti muscles. We have the superior rectus. We have the inferior rectus, we have the medial and also the lateral recti muscles. So for the superior rectus muscle, this is the superior rectus muscle. And this muscle is involved in elevation of the eyeball, also adduction and also internal rotation. Remember when we tried to describe the part of this muscle in our previous slide, we said that the superior rectus needs to run a lateral course before it assumes its insertion point on the upper part of the anterior half of the high ball. And this is because of the direction of the apex of the orbit, where this muscle emerges from, because it is directed posterior medially. So it needs to run laterally before it will finally assume that upper insertion at the anterior half of the eyeball. And that is why it's able to bring about adduction and also internal rotation. Then going to the inferior rectus muscle, this is where we have the inferior rectus muscle here, arrowed in yellow, these are the inferior part. And the movement it exhibits is depression of the eyeball because it's at the lower part. It's also involved in adduction and also external rotation. This is also attributed to the part of this muscle because it's also not seen to have a direct part because of the position of the apex of the orbit because it is directed posterior medially. So the inferior rectus also needs to run lateral course before it will finally see a space at the inferior part of the anterior half of the eyeball where it will be inserted upon. Then we have the medial rectus muscle. It is the medial rectus muscle that is seen on the medial side. And what it does is basically adduction. Then we have the lateral rectus. This is the lateral rectus here, arrowed in blue. And the lateral rectus is involved in abduction. 
So you can see that the media rectors adopt, the lateral rectors abduct. Then going to the oblique muscle, we have two oblique muscles. We have the superior and the inferior oblique. So for the superior oblique muscle, this is the superior oblique muscle here, hard in red. For the superior oblique, you see it running and parting through the trochlea before it is finally directed laterally and also posteriorly, where it will be inserted on the posterior half of the eyeball. So what this muscle is involved in is abduction, depression, and also internal rotation. Then for the inferior oblique, this is the inferior oblique muscle here that is seen to be arrowed in blue. This muscle, of course, we see emerges from the medial side of the floor of the orbit. It crosses the floor and, of course, is directed laterally and also posteriorly, where it will be finally inserted on the posterior half of the eyeball. And what this does is to abduct to elevate and also external rotation of the eyeball. So those are the movements that are exhibited by the different oblique muscles. Then going to the last extracular muscle, this muscle is not involved in the movement of the eyeball. What it does primarily is the elevation of the upper eyelid. And we would see how it originates and also where it is inserted upon. And this will be used to justify the movement action of this muscle. So this muscle is the most superiorly placed muscle. Out of all the extraocular muscle, Levito papebrae superioris muscle is also referred to as LPS. This muscle, you can see it is superiorly placed. And what it does basically is to elevate the upper eyelid. If you go deep down here, we have the superior rectus and inferior to this, we have the superior oblique muscle. So you can see that out of the extraocular muscles that are located at the superior part, is the most superiorly placed muscle as seen also in this image. And above this muscle is the frontal nerve. So you see the frontal nerve here highlighted in blue. This frontal nerve is seen above it. So you see it parting forward and finally it divides into the supratrochlear nerve and also the supraorbital nerve. This frontal nerve, we know that it is a branch of the ophthalmic nerve, which is the first branch of the trigeminal nerve. And it's one of the structures that pack through the superior orbital feature. So giving off a frontal nerve, you see it parting along it before it finally divides into the supratrochlear and also the supraorbital nerve. So it's good for us to be able to highlight this as a relation. So talking about the origination of this muscle, where does this muscle originate from? It seems to originate above the optic foramen. Remember we have the optic foramen at the apex of the orbit. It is seen at the posterior medial side of the orbit. And around it, we have a common tendinal string where we have the emergence of the rectum muscle. This optic foramen, above it, we have the emergence or the origin of the levator papebrae superioris muscle. And this is specifically on the lesser wing of sphenoid. So this is where we have the central ring where the rectal muscle emerges from. So above this point is where we have the emergence. It's the most superiorly placed muscle. And this is attributed to how it originates. If you look at how it originates, it is seen above the point where we have the origination of other extraocular muscles. And that is why it is seen to be the most superiorly placed muscle. Also parting from the point where it originated, moving forward to the anterior part of the eye. So it specifically originates above the optic foramen, where we have the annulus of Zim. And of course, it is specifically on the lesser wing of sphenoid. So we have the superior rectus muscle that is located deep to it. Then we have the superior oblique also located deep to it. So as this muscle emerges from the superior part of the optic foramen, you see it directed forward. So it does not only move forward, it also exhibits some form of transformation. And this is basically with it becoming flattened and also broadened. You can see where it emerges from at this point here that is arrowed in black. So as it tends to move forward, it begins to broaden out and also flattens out. So at this point, you see that it has become wider. And at the end, you see it running forward. And finally, it ends in 
aponeurosis. So you see it ending in aponeurosis. And this aponeurosis, of course, will become wider because it will be spreading apart. So if you look at this image down here, this is where we have the final terminal point. You can see this aponeurosis, this tendinous sheet widening out. At the end, you have the anterior part at the front here, the arrow here in purple. You have the medial part here, arrow here in yellow. Then you have the lateral part here, also arrowed at this point. So you have the spreading out of aponeurotic network. It will be inserting on different regions because of the spread of aponeurosis. So let's look at where it is inserted upon. As we described in our previous slide, we already described how this muscle finally ends in aponeurotic network and of course spreading out. And this means that it will be having multiple points of insertion. And we've described previously that we have the anterior part of the aponeurotic network. And this is the anterior part here, arrowed in black. We have the medial part here, arrowed in yellow. Then we have the lateral part here, arrowed in green. Because of the way or the pattern by which the aponeurosis spread at the front. Because as they emerge, they emerge as a small muscle. So as it goes forward, it begins to flatten and also broadens out. Then finally ending in an aponeurosis. And this is the pattern by which this aponeurosis is extended in the anterior part. So we have different insertion points for the different sub-regions of the aponeurosis. So for the anterior part that is already in black, it's also inserted on a number of structures, but primarily the bulk of the anterior fibers here will be inserted on the anterior surface of the superior tarsal plate. This is where we have the tarsal plate here. This is the superior tarsal plate, which is a dense connective tissue that is seen at the upper part of the opening of the eye. We have the inferior tarsal plate here, which is a dense connective tissue that is seen at the lower part of the opening of the eye. The superior tarsal plate is more prominent than the inferior tarsal plate. So you see fibers from the anterior region of this aponeurosis inserting on the anterior surface of the superior tarsal plate. This is the superior tarsal plate. So you can actually see fibers from this anterior part being inserted on the anterior surface of the tarsal plate. If you look at this image up here, this is where we have the superior tarsal plate and inferior to it, we have the inferior tarsal plate. Then at the middle here is where we have the opening of the eye. You can see the eyelashes at this point. So you see that the fibers are seen to be inserted on the anterior part of the superior tarsal plate. And this is what is harrowed here in black. This is where we have the superior tarsal plate. This is the anterior surface. So this is where we have the anterior collection of fibers of the aponeurosis being inserted on the anterior part of the superior tarsal plate. And this is the primary point of insertion. We also have other minor or secondary points of insertion still within the anterior collection of the aponeurosis. We also have other insertion points on the superior tarsal muscle. The superior tarsal muscle is a smooth muscle component of the levator papebrae superioris muscle, the skeletal type of muscle. Remember when we described about its origination point, where it originates from, specifically is on the lesser wing of spinoid, which of course is located above the optic foramen. So it is a skeletal type of muscle, but this muscle is seen to have a smooth muscle component. And this is called the superior tarsal muscle. This is where we have the superior tarsal muscle here, arrowed in yellow, and also seen to be dotted. So this is where we have the superior tarsal muscle. You can see that we also have fibers also inserting at this point. Then this superior tarsal muscle will then be further inserted on the superior part of the superior tarsal plate. So if you look at it, this is the superior tarsal plate. At the upper part, you have the connection with the superior tarsal muscle here, then the superior tarsal muscle, of course, receives fibers from the aponeurosis. So it also has its attachment point on the superior tarsal muscle, after which the superior tarsal muscle will then finally be connected or be inserted on the upper surface of the superior tarsal plate. So that is how this configuration is presented here. So this is where we have the insertion point in the upper part 
of the superior tarsal plate. The another point of insertion is on the conjunctiva phonics. The conjunctiva phonics is a junction between the palbebral part of the conjunctiva and also the bulbar part of the conjunctiva. Using this image here, this is the configuration of the high. This is the high bowl, these are the eyelids, this is the upper eyelid, this is the lower eyelid, and this is where we have the eyelashes. So within the interior wall of the high lid and also the anterior surface here of the sclera, we have the conjunctiva. This conjunctiva can further be subdivided into two. We have the palbebra part, which is the part that is seen to line the inferior part of the high lid, and this is what is arrowed here. Then we have another subregion that is seen to overlie the anterior part of the sclera, and this is what is also arrowed here. There is a point where the palbebra part and also the bulbar part of the conjunctiva meet, and this point is called the phonix, and this is what is arrowed here in white. So if you look at this image here, we also have the phonix here arrowed in white, which is the junction where the palbebra part and also the bulbar part of the conjunctiva meet. So at this point, you can see that fibers are also seen to insert at this point. And finally, they are also inserted on the skin of the upper eyelid. If you look at this image here that is arrowed in blue, this is where they are inserted on the skin also of the upper eyelid. You can see that the anterior collection of the aponeuroses are inserted on structures outside the eyeball. All the structures or regions where they are inserted upon are not on the eyeball. They are inserted on the superior tarsal plate, the superior tarsal muscle, the conjunctival furnace, and also the skin of the upper eyelid. So that is why they are not seen to control the movement of the eyeball because they are not inserted on the eyeball. When they are inserted on the eyeball, they will be able to control the movement of the eyeball. So they are not inserted on the eyeball, but where they are inserted upon is around the upper eyelid. And this is why they are able to control the elevation of the upper eyelid. So this is where the anterior collection of the aponeuroses are inserted upon. I remember that we talked about this aponeuroses being also seen to extend medially and also laterally. So on the medial side that is harrowed here in yellow, you see that they form the medial horn of the aponeuroses. While on the lateral side that is harrowed here in green, they form the lateral horn of the aponeurosis, which means the aponeurosis is seen to present a medial horn and also a lateral horn. Of course, they have the central anterior collection that, of course, we've described previously in a number of sites that they are seen to be inserted upon. So going to the medial collection, which forms the medial horn, this is seen to merge with the medial cantor stendor. While on the lateral side that is harrowed here in green, seems to exhibit some form of characteristics. At the lateral side here is where we have the lacrimal gland. This is the lacrimal gland that is harrowed here in red. At the superior lateral part of the bony orbit is where we have the lacrimal fossa, which is seen to accommodate the lacrimal gland. So the lateral horn of the aponeurosis is seen to divide the lacrimal gland into the two subregions that it is made up of, which include the palbebral part and also the orbital part. And this is where it crosses the lacrimal gland, dividing it into the two subregions that it is made up of. After dividing it, you see it running finally and be inserted on the witness tobacco. The witness tobacco we also described in our previous lecture on the bony orbit, where we said that it is an elevation of bone that is created around the lateral wall of the orbit. This is where we have the insertion of the lateral on of the aponeurosis. Also to add that we talked about the superior tarsal muscle. The superior tarsal muscle, we say that is a smooth muscle component. And of course, it's one of the attachment sites at the anterior aponeurosis. Because it's a smooth muscle, it is innervated by sympathetic nerve. And this is in contrast with the innervation of the levator papebri superioris muscle which is innervated by the oculomotor. So it's good for us to be able to establish it. This we are asked during examination, and it is innervated by different nerve. Even though it's a component of this muscle, it's 
innovation is different. So let's talk about the innovations of the extracular muscles. The extracular muscles are innovated by three major nerves. We have the oculomotor nerve, which is the top cranial nerve. We have the trochlear nerve, which is the fourth cranial nerve. Then we have the abducens nerve, which is the sixth cranial nerve. These three nerves are the nerves that are seen to innovate all the extraocular muscles. We've described seven extraocular muscles, six of which control the movement of the eyeball, while one is used for the elevation of the upper eyelid. So these three nerves are seen to innovate all the extraocular muscles. To be able to highlight these in the most easiest way, there is a key that is needed for us to be able to easily highlight the different nerves that are seen to innovate all the extraocular muscles. So we have this key, we have the LRCs and SO4. So this is the key that we need. L means lateral, while HAR means rectus. So it means the lateral rectus muscle is seen to be innervated by the cyst cranial now, which is the abducens now. Then SO4, S means superior, O means oblique, and of course, 4 is the fourth cranial nerve. So it means that the superior oblique is innervated by the fourth cranial nerve, which is the trochlear nerve. So that is how this key will be used to unlock the different nerves that are seen to innervate all the extraocular muscles. Then going through the extraocular muscles, we have seven. This is the list of the extraocular muscles. We have the superior rectus, we have the inferior rectus, we have the medial rectus, we have the lateral rectus. These are all the four rectal muscles. Then we have two obliques. We have the superior oblique muscle. We have the inferior oblique muscle. Then the last muscle is the levator papebrae superioris muscle. And this is the muscle that is seen to control the elevation of the upper eyelid, while the remaining six are involved in the movement of the eyeball. So talking about the innovations, we already described the LRCs. That means we'll be going to the lateral rectus, and the lateral rectus here will be innervated by the cyst cranial nerve, which is the abducens nerve. Then going to the SO4, which is the superior oblique. Superior oblique will be innervated by the trochlear nerve, which is the fourth cranial nerve. But it's good for us to note this fact that the control is contralateral, which means that the trochlear nucleus on the left side will be controlling the superior oblique on the right, why the trochlear nucleus on the right will be controlling the superior oblique on the left because of the decussation of its fibers. The other extraocular muscles will be innervated by the oculomotor nerve because we've used up the key and the remaining nerve that is remaining is the oculomotor nerve, which means that the remaining extraocular muscles will be innervated by this nerve. So for the superior rectus, it will be innervated by the superior branch of the oculomotor nerve. The inferior rectus will be innervated by the inferior branch of the oculomotor nerve. The medial rectus will also be innervated by the inferior branch of the oculomotor nerve. So let's go down to the inferior oblique muscle. The inferior oblique muscle will also be innervated by the inferior branch of the oculomotor nerve. Then the levator papebrae superioris muscle will also be innervated by the superior branch of the oculomotor nerve. So you can see that the oculomotor nerve is innervating the bulk of the extracular muscle. It is just the lateral rectus that is innervated by the abducens nerve and also the superior oblique that is innervated by the trochlear nerve. I'm going to the applied anatomy. In this image, we have the superior rectus, we have the inferior rectus, we have the medial rectus, we have the lateral rectus. Then we have the superior and also the inferior oblique muscle. So all these muscles are involved in the movement of the eyeball because their insertion point is on the eyeballs. If we have the paralysis of nerves that are seen to innervate this muscle, it's definitely going to affect the actions of this muscle. We already established in our previous slide that we have the oculomotor nerve, the trochlear nerve, and also the abducens nerve. This three nerves are the ones seen to innervate the extraocular muscle. So any injury or damage to these nerves will definitely affect the functions of this muscle. So let's take each of the nerves one after the other. So let's talk about the abducens nerve, which is the cyst cranial nerve. So paralysis or injury to the cyst cranial nerve, because we know that the cyst cranial nerve, which is the abducens nerve, innervates the lateral rectus muscle, which is the LRCs. We still remember the key that we use in unlocking the easy highlight 
sites of the different nerves of the extraocular nerve. So we have the abducens nerve innervating the lateral rectus muscle here. This is where we have the lateral rectus here on the lateral side. And this muscle is known to abduct the high, which is for abduction of the high ball. That is the function that it does. So if there is a paralysis of these nerves, it's going to affect this action. That means the highs will not be able to be abducted. So what we see is that the patient cannot look straight. The high ball will be turned in. So that is the kind of exhibition that will be seen. So you see high turned in because the abduction of the high ball cannot occur because of the damage to the abducens nerve that innervates the lateral rectus, which is responsible for abduction. Then the next one is the trochlear nerve paralysis. The trochlear nerve is the fourth cranial nerve. And we know that the trochlear nerve innervates the superior oblique, which is the SOCs. This is the superior oblique muscle. And what it does is depression. So it helps to depress the high ball. So if this nerve is damaged, it's going to affect the action of depressing the high ball, which means that the patient cannot look down. So it's going to affect the action of this muscle. And a good illustration is when we try to climb the staircase Trying to look down will not be possible. Then the next one is the oculomotor nerve paralysis, which is the third cranial nerve. We know that the bulk of the extracular muscles are supplied or innervated by the oculomotor nerve. So the actions will definitely be affected. And one of the muscles that it also innervates is the levator papillary superioris muscle, which has to control the elevation of the upper eyelid. And if there is damage to the oculomotor nerve, it means that the upper high lid cannot be elevated. So it's going to be looked down and also hard work. Two C's is when the eyelid cannot be elevated. So you have the eyelid dropping down in this scenario. So when you have oculomotor nerve damage, all the muscles that are involved, the actions also will definitely be impaired. So for ptosis, we have complete ptosis or partial ptosis. So for complete ptosis, there's going to be the inability to open the upper eyelid because the elevation of the eyelid is controlled by the oculomotor nerve. And if the oculomotor nerve is damaged, that means the upper eyelid will not be able to be opened. So it's going to be dropped down and closed completely. But you can also have partial ptosis. Partial ptosis is when there is loss in the sympathetic innervation of the superior tarsal muscle. Remember we talked about the superior tarsal muscle. This muscle we say is innervated by several separate nerve because it's a smooth type of muscle. So it's innervated by sympathetic fibers. So if this sympathetic innervation is lost or is damaged, it's going to cause a partial ptosis, an incomplete closure of the heart. So we can check our understanding of this lecture through the following. Describe the origins and insertions of all the recti. Then the second question is, what is the orientation of the superior oblique muscle? We already described this muscle as having a very dramatic path from its origination points down to where it is inserted. Then the third question is to explain the innervations of the extraocular muscle. We already described this in the most easiest form. The next question is, I like the nerves affected in partial slash complete doses. Then the last question is, what is annulus or zinc? So thanks for watching this video. Let's meet again in our next lecture class.